How you doing? KO Euro students. Back once again by unpopular demand. We get into section three of chapter 23, the age of mass society. But now what we're going to talk about is not labor unions and all those other things. Well, maybe a little bit. We're going to talk in this episode about the national states of Europe and the transformations that were uh, undergoing during this time. Okay, so again, back by unpopular demand. This will help you out. May 6 is on its way. Let's get this done. Okay, so again, mass society led to mass politics. All right, what are we talking about with mass politics? Massive amounts of people. When male suffrage was the rule, uh, the welfare state starts to emerge in Germany first. And then, um, you know, a lot of times in these governments, these governmental reforms, political reforms, were often led by conservatives. We saw this in Chapter 22 with Benjamin Disraeli, even though it backfired. Uh, for him with the Reform Act of 1867. But anyway, so we have progress in liberalism. We have constitutions. We have more parliaments. We have more individual liberties and voting rights um, being granted to numerous uh, peoples or numerous uh, states across Europe. And part of that is, go back to the last section, uh, and we're talking about revisionism thanks to Edward Bernstein. We don't need a massive communist uprising. Socialism uh, is the ability to work within the framework of the government. So uh, that reform brought about the expansion of voting rights, as I said. What they also did was created mass political parties. What we start to see, we mentioned the SPD, um, but we're going to start to see these things emerge and be more common, where in Europe, you know, uh, with monarchies and absolute monarchies and things of that nature, there, there really was no need for uh, a political party. So we'll see massive political parties being formed in a lot of these Western European nations. And um, also, again, we talked about the North uh, West versus the Southeast. In the Eastern parts, you still have the continuation of the old order. The old regimes in Eastern Europe were preserved, and the nobility and the landed elite resisted the changes that we're talking about here uh, in places like Russia. Just saying, though, spoiler alert, changes are coming soon. Yes, even in Russia. So in terms of the political growth of political democracy and the expansion of the franchise, uh, we need to go, uh, you know, kind of rehash a few things here. If you remember, the Reform Act of 1832 shifted the power in Parliament in the House of Commons to the upper bourgeoisie. And again, the, the massively rich industrialists in places like Manchester and Liverpool. They were the industrial elites, and so they redistricted um, how different uh, areas and, and uh, provinces in England send members to Parliament, and they gave more power and recognition to some of those industrial cities. Uh, overall, though, it wasn't a radical change in the amount of people voting because only one more million people, approximately, were able to actually vote. So, again, gradual change in England. Uh, then you had the uh, Reform Act that I just mentioned of 1867 with Benjamin Disraeli and the Conservatives and the Tories trying to throw a bone and, and preserve their power backfired with them, but what you had there was, again, a continuation of further expansion of suffrage. And we said anywhere from two to three million more people were able to participate in electing parliamentary members. Um, and then what you get into in Chapter 22 is the Reform Act of 1884. And again, it was passed by liberal leader uh, William Gladstone. you got to kind of give props to him. And it extended voting rights to all men who paid regular rent and taxes, and it significantly increased political activism of the agricultural workers in England. They also passed the Redistribution Act, which eliminated a lot of the old school rocket boroughs, pocket boroughs, and that started the that process started in 1832. Um, you know, and, and again, they they continued to base representation on equal population, equal representation. All right, and again, uh, when we talk about synthesis, we've mentioned this in Chapter 18. Um, this is what John Wilkes was calling for in the 18th century. One of the things that he thought that they needed to do was pay members of Parliament salaries, all right, in the House of Commons, and they did that by 1911. You know, might be asking, well, why why would you pay these people? Well, it's kind of what we have going on in the United States in the state of Pennsylvania. Even though Pennsylvania is the third most corrupt state uh, in the Union at this particular time. Uh, by particular rankings. But what you're doing here with paying your uh, members of parliament, it opens up political participation and activism to more common people. Uh, and again, up until this point, think about it, the only way you could actually serve in parliament is if you had enough money where you didn't have to work every day. Um, so what they're doing here is actually paying these people salaries and they're actually becoming like professional politicians. 
Okay, and I know that's kind of disgusting, uh, but it was trying to even the playing field. So not just the rich elites or the middle class, um, the fact that they were offering salaries uh, opened up these opportunities to even some in the lower middle class. Okay, now, spoiler alert here, no women suffered. Stay tuned. We'll talk about that in the next chapter. Um, so the story of Great Britain overall is a story of gradual reform in their parliamentary procedure and parliamentary legislation. All right, we talk about Irish nationalism. There's a little slot of this in Chapter 23. And uh, ironically, the gradual reform that we've talked about in England and their ability to adapt failed to solve what is known as the Irish question. So what you need to know is a little bit of background here. The Irish had been subject to the British rule in the Act of Union in 1801, united English and Irish parliaments together. Um, and again, we've talked about this in other countries, just like the other unfree ethnic groups of Europe, whether it's the Czechs, Slavs, Serbs, before the Augsburg, um, the Hungarians, they developed their own sense of nationalism, and they already had a strong sense of uh, self-consciousness, if you will. And the Irish hate the British and the so-called absentee landlords. And if you read that, you might be wondering, what the heck is that? Well, this is the case where in Northern Ireland, if you look on this map, British had controlled large landed estates, really since the days of Cromwell's crushing victory uh, against the Irish revolt during the English Civil War. Now again, Irish Catholics began to demand independence. Why are the British owning some of the best land here in Ireland? We want we don't want them here. We want home rule. And again, you got to know that term, home rule. So in 1870, this is getting kind of interesting, um, Gladstone, Prime Minister, tries to make things better by enacting limited reform, kind of going with what the British normally do. But the Irish tenants continued to be evicted as they couldn't pay their rents. This had been going on also. Um, in the 1840s with the decline of uh, the potato crop, the failure of the potato crop, also known as the uh, Irish potato famine. So uh, what they started to do was actually stir things up with violence and, you know, borderline terroristic uh, attacks on their British landlords. So the Irish Land League in 1879 called for independence and called on Parliament to do something in the way of land reform. A guy named Charles Parnell, an Irish leader in Parliament, called for home rule or self-government. They wanted a separate Parliament uh, but not complete independence. And if you're looking at that and thinking, what the heck does that mean? Separate Parliament but not complete independence. Think about the Augsburg. Think about the dual monarchy that was established in Austria-Hungary in 1867. So that's what they're trying to, that's, a, that's what Charles Pornell is uh, pushing for. But nothing happens. So the Irish peasants uh, kind of step up their game a little bit and engage in more terroristic uh, activity. And Britain responds with more force. And the Irish Catholics start demanding full independence. Now, Gladstone does, in 1886, propose a Home Rule Act, but it was voted down by many of the conservatives who believed that there would only be more violence, and this wasn't going anywhere. They did pass a Home Rule Act in 1914, but it was suspended. Why? World War I broke out. So um, and the other reason why it was suspended is because Irish Protestants in northern, up here, Irish Protestants, and, and many of these are the landlords in Northern Ireland, don't want it. All right, they want they still want to be attached. They still want to be part of uh, England, even though they're in the minority. Okay, so uh, the Paris Commune and the Third Republic. Um, they kind of jump into this. This is a continuation. If you go back to Chapter Twenty Two and um, the Franco-Prussian War, so we know France was defeated in the Franco-Prussian War, and the Second Empire of Napoleon the Third collapses. Now Bismarck forces the French. Uh, and this is slap in the face to the French, but choose, to choose a government, and he makes them choose one based on universal male suffrage. Uh, remember, Napoleon III had gotten rid of that essentially by making himself emperor for, for life, hereditary. But the Germans uh, tell, what to, tell the French what to do. Again, stay tuned. They're going to be out for revenge in World War I, and everybody knows this. Now, the French people reject the Republicans and actually favored bringing back monarchists. Conservatives actually won 400 of the 630 seats in the new National Assembly. So in 1871, you know, the radical Republicans aren't going to go for that. And in Paris, they set up their own independent government. Um, they're going to say, we're going to do it our way. This is known as the Commune, the Paris Commune. Here we go again in France and in Paris. Go figure. But the commune is significant because of its vicious fighting. 
Um, it really is. It, you know, it, it's not just that, though. It's also because many working class men and women move to defend the values and the Republican values of the commune. Much like the, again, synthesis here, much, much like the sans culotte and the women of the initial French Revolution. In fact, women by the end, um, the situation became so desperate with the Paris Commune, served as scouts and, and ran their own fighting units. Um, so, you know, we're talking about equality here. Um, you know, you think of Molly Pitcher and A Push and things of that nature, but nonetheless, women were actively, actively involved here. But what ends up happening is the government of the Third Republic crushes the commune by 1871. It's like a siege, um, and the story goes they even like eat the elephants and the lions in the uh, Paris Zoo um, because they're starving. But 20,000 of the revolutionaries are shot, 10,000 are shipped off to the South Pacific in exile, and even women who um, participated in the revolt here in the Paris Commune are brutally dealt with and shot. Um, so what you have here is France being very, very divided politically. Go figure. Republicans, liberals, and the middle class, even the peasants, they support the Third Republic. Monarchists, Catholic clergy, army officers, they hate the Third Republic. And then the socialists, uh, they want more radical change, so they're not playing the game. So what you have here is kind of an um, unstable situation. And despite the majority of the monarchists controlling the assembly, what happens with them is they're divided. They couldn't agree on who should be king, and what they end up doing is missing their opportunity. And in 1875, new constitution establishes a republican form of government as basically the least divisive compromise. And there's an upper house and a lower house in the legislature. The upper house, which is the Senate, was elected indirectly. And then there's a chamber of deputies, which is kind of like the House of Representatives, that the lower house, just like the Reichstag as well in Germany, was chosen by universal male suffrage. So essentially what you need to know about the Third Republic is not everybody's happy with it. It's basically a compromise. Uh, and interestingly enough, it's a compromise which lasts for 65 years. Now, there was a major threat to the Third Republic in 1889, and you got to know this on the AP exam. It's the Boulanger Crisis, and General Boulanger gained support of the military. And what he does is, we know that the, the military doesn't like this new government. He plots a coup to overthrow the Republic. Again, many people don't like the Republic, the Bonapartists, the monarchists, the arist uh, aristocrats, and nationalists who favor a war. They want a war now with revenge with Germany. They don't like this new government. So they're looking for a leader, and he was known as the strong man on the horseback, as you can see in this picture, and potentially the savior of France. Remember, France is always looking for that savior, Napoleon, um, whoever that may be. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this in chapter 24, but at the last minute, he loses his nerve. Uh, and he was called to trial, but before he could stand trial, he committed suicide. So his fall resulted in an increased confidence, public confidence in the Third Republic. And as I said, it's going to last for 65 years. Now, what's going on in Spain? Uh, interestingly enough, Spain and Italy, we're going to talk about. The Catholic Church and the large landowners and the army prevent any type of reform and liberalization in Spain. You know, the Catholic Church here is always a roadblock, and it had been going all the way back to the days of Charles V and the days of Philip II and the Habsburgs. Well, this proves disastrous, as they were really unable to adapt to a lot of the modern changes in the economy that we talked about in Section 1, and uh, keeping up and, and uh, keeping up with the Joneses in terms of their military and naval might. And what happens in 1898 is it is thoroughly embarrassed by the young United States in the Spanish-American War. They lost the Philippines, they lost Cuba, and they were just brutally uh, embarrassed. In fact, their entire fleet, Pacific Fleet, was sank in, I believe it was seven hours, in uh, the Philippines. So what happens here is, you know, you, you get embarrassed like that, you're going to have people step up and say, hey, we need to change some things. So a group of young intellectuals, similar to the Burschenschaften in Germany in the early 19th century, they're, they're called the Generation of 1898. And what do they want? They want a wave of social and political reform to kind of get Spain back in line with what's going on in the rest of Europe. So the bottom line, though, is they're very unsuccessful. Very little reform ensued. Uh, made socialism and, and anarchism. Even though Spain is in the western part of Europe, you have some radical ideas that are taking uh, root there because of how messed up and how backward it is. They have a large, discontented lower class. And in 1909, violence erupts. Uh, and it was brutally suppressed. 
So, in essentially, you know, essentially, reform was thwarted by the conservatives in Spain. And um, what you have here in this slide is a picture of the leader of the 1909 insurrection, Francisco Ferrer. Um, anyway, he was the accused leader, um, who was a teacher and anarchist, was executed after a mock trial, just a joke, by the government and the Catholic Church. And they were working together to suppress this revolt. Now, Italy was an Alice state. We learned that in chapter 22. But many Italians saw their family and the traditions as more important than the loyalty to the state. Go back to the Medici. Go back to the Italian Renaissance when there, you know, there was a lot of division. In Italy, the family and the families that have the power in those particular towns, they, they traditionally are um, the entity of power that people turn to. So you don't, even though you have an, an Italian state, you don't really have this modern sense of unifying nationalism as exists in a lot of the other European states. The North, as we know, was rich. The South was poor and rural. Um, similar to pre-war, Civil War United States, the antebellum era in the United States and its history. But there's no sense of unity. And the Catholic Church is also a bitter, you know, bitter about this um, this new state. They remember they lost the papal state. So in some cases, the Pope refuses to recognize the the Italian state officially. So you have a weak and unstable government which was constantly divided over turmoil between workers and industrialists, and it undermined unity further. You really don't have a sense of mass society in Spain. You don't have a sense of mass society in Italy here. So these are the exceptions. Um, there's extensive corruption in government. Only 2.5% of the people could actually vote for the legislative body. So it wasn't very Republican. Garibaldi and Mazzini would be just offended by this, um, the, the realities of this new Italian state. So it was increased by 10% in 1882, but what you have is government coalitions really failing to bring about any stability, any unity, and really any great power status. So they're going to be looking for a leader in the early uh, 20th century, and then after their embarrassment in um, at the Treaty of Versailles, they're going to be looking for a strong leader, and that long, strong leader will be Benito Mussolini. Uh, he's taking note as we speak. All right, um, Central and Eastern Europe continued, uh, despite the dual monarch in the Augsburg of 1867 and the liberal actions of Francis Joseph, which included suffrage and parliamentary bodies, the reality was Austria-Hungary remained authoritarian, conservative, and controlled by the forces of conservatism. They did not reform, and it was very, 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 very corrupt. Okay, Monarchy, very, very powerful. And in Russia, as we mentioned, after the assassination of Alexander II, uh, the czars that, that ensued, Alexander III and Nicholas II, were more determined than ever to preserve the old conservative order. In fact, the Zemstovs uh, lost power. And remember, Alexander II was going to have a Duma or a constitutional or parliamentary body. That was repealed and forgotten. Now, Germany, Imperial Germany. Germany's unified, right? Yay! Or yay? Really? There were still deep divisions internally that couldn't be smoothed over by the sly real politic style of Bismarck himself. There's a bicameral legislature. Yes, the Bundesrat is the upper house, the Senate. Um, they represent 25 states of Germany. Some states, even like Bavaria and Prussia, kept their own kings, their old traditional um, you know, leaders. Their post offices and even armies in peace, peacetime were left up to the individual states. Reminds me of the Articles of Confederation in the early days of the young American Republic. The lower house was called the Reichstag, elected on the basis of universal male suffrage, but it didn't have ministerial uh, you know, responsibility. In other words, the final say in affairs uh, of the state, they didn't have it. In fact, the chancellor wasn't even responsible at this particular time in history to parliament. He was responsible solely to the emperor. So it was the Kaiser, the emperor, who controlled the army, foreign policy, and really the internal administration. So what? Well, Germany had a parliament and voting and universal suffrage, but democracy failed to grow. Why? The army in Bismarck didn't answer to the legislature. They served the Kaiser, and they served the emperor. All right, now, Bismarck. What do we need to know here? Bismarck, who served as chancellor until 1890, prevented the liberalization, further liberalization of Germany. At first, he worked with liberals who desired the national state. We learned this, or modern Germany. Nationalism was a liberal ideal. But at the same time, as he did all that, he achieved greater centralization of, for the Kaiser and the emperor's power. Liberal also joined Bismarck in his attack initially on the Catholic Church. Um, 
liberals in the middle class in Bismarck, they distrust the Catholic Church and the Catholic loyalty to the new Germany. Remember, you have traditional, Martin Luther was a German. Protestantism was originated in Germany. The other thing you need to remember back in chapter 22, that southern Italy, or I'm sorry, southern Germany traditionally held out from the German unification process until the Ems Telegram, until the Franco-Prussian War and the fact that Prussia had gained uh, momentum. Then they jumped on the nationalism gravy train. But there, were, there was a Catholic center party in Germany um, who really made a lot of Germans paranoid after 1870. And we'll learn this in chapter 24. Pope Pius IX, with all the things that are going on with unification and liberalism, actually declares papal infallibility and encourages Catholics around the world to remain loyal only to him, not the state. So liberals saw that as old school traditional source of conservatism. Obviously, Bismarck doesn't like it. He calls his war against the Catholics culture comp or struggle for civilization and tried to get nationalism behind this and basically uh, tried to strong arm the Catholic Church and, and drive it underground kind of like Robespierre did, if you think about it, in the French Revolution um, with his de-Christianization agenda. Well, Bismarck should have learned. It failed. This failed. Um, did I just make a contextualization or sy synthesis reference? Man, but yeah, I did. Hey, congratulations. This Catholic Center Party proved too popular among many Germans to be driven underground. Bismarck ultimately failed to suppress that Catholic Center Party, so... What's he got to do? He's got to find somebody else to battle. So after that failure, he abandons the liberals and decides to put on his more conservative hat. He decides to go after yet another perceived threat to German nationalism and loyalty and unity. Wait for it. The socialists. So we've already established earlier that the chapter that the Social Democratic Party, a.k.a. the SPD, held Marxist views. Remember, those Marxist views, worldwide revolution, are interpreted in many cases as anti-nationalistic, anti-military, anti-capitalism, and anti-monarchy, anti-everything for crying out loud. Plus, in 1878, the SPD starts to elect, they gain a foothold in the Reichstag. They elect 12 deputies. This really alarmed good old Otto von Bismarck. He decided to attempt once again to use real politic and beat them at their own game. First, he passes a bunch of so anti-socialist laws to be passed by enemies uh, of the SPD or towards the enemies of the SPD uh, in the Reichstag. Get the other groups that don't like these socialists to pass these because they're still in the majority in the Reichstag. So they outlaw the SPD as a party. They limit the ability of socialists to meet, and they also restrict socialist publications. And then what do they do? They start advocating and supporting sweeping social legislation, meaning, again, Disraeli style, real politics, try to beat them at the own game, their own game. If you give the people what they want, maybe they won't turn to these socialist political parties. So in order to woo workers away from socialism, he starts instituting a set of sweeping reforms in order to minimize the threat from the left or the socialists. In 1879, there's a protective tariff that was instituted to maintain domestic production. That helps with the economy. That helps with the jobs. He also helped the German economy and employment. Modern social security laws were established. Germany was the first state to do so. There was a national sickness and accident insurance law passed in 1883 and 1884 to if you got hurt on the job and you, you couldn't work. You, you got insurance. You got a almost a pension. Speaking of pension, old age pensions. We talked about Social Security and retirement benefits were established in 1889. Now, these pensions were funded by mandatory contributions from workers, employers, and the state. Very progressive. Way ahead of his time. The United States won't do this till the 1930s in the, in the New Deal. He laid, regulated more child labor. He improved working conditions for virtually all workers. Despite the better standard of living, what happened? The workers didn't leave the SPD. In fact, the SPD continues to grow. The SPD pointed out that a lot of these things were, yeah, they were nice on paper, but they pulled out. They pointed out that the full pension for people that retired could only be achieved at age 70 after 48 years of contributions. Uh, contributions. And if a male worker died, no benefits were given to his widow or his kids. So they were like, that's messed up as, as it was. So Bismarck was frustrated and he didn't, in the end, uh, he didn't end the perceived threat of the socialists. So he planned on carrying out more old school measures against them. He was going to go after them, Metternich style, if you will, whack-a-mole style. But unfortunately for Bismarck, 
the new emperor, Kaiser Wilhelm II, dismisses him in 1890 to establish his own personal rule. Okay, Austria-Hungary. Talked a little bit about this after the creation of the dual monarchy. Um, you basically get rid of all liberal reforms, and Francis Joseph is an authoritarian leader. The biggest problem with them uh, in Austria-Hungary are the different nationalities who felt they deserved their own parliament or representation, just like Hungary had been given, Czechs, Poles, and Slavs. Count Edward von Toffa, prime minister, attempted to deal with this threat with a coalition of German conservatives, Czechs, and Poles to maintain a concerted majority in their parliament. And in order for them to play this game, he gave them concessions, like allowing Slavic languages and German to be used in education and administration, not just German. Uh, this made the German-speaking people really, really mad, and the Austrian bureaucracy really, really upset. And, you know, kind of like if the president today tried to get Congress to pass national legislation that made Spanish equal to English language in America. Um, some people, as you can imagine, would get upset. Austria-Hungary essentially was held together by Francis Joseph, the loyalty to the Catholic Church, which actually helped keep the Czechs, Slovaks, and Poles loyal because they're Catholic. But additionally, the Hungarian side had a parliamentary system, but it was dominated by the Magyar landowning class who dominated the peasants and all the other nationalities in their domain. What they attempted to do is keep everybody in line with Magyarization, which imposed their way of life, their language on all schools, etc., forcing all the other nationalities within their domain to conform. And as we stated already, all reform was out the door in Russia. Hey, thanks for tuning in. Hopefully this helps you with the quiz that you need to take over the weekend. God bless you. God bless America. God bless Western civilization. Wow, that was deep. Have a good weekend.